Yeah, I also would like to start with a thank you to Madame Lagarde and Dr. Weidmann for your open, clear and uh, insightful uh, comments. I think the key message I took with me was the point that, yes, we have achieved a lot, we have made a lot of progress, but the to-do list is still very long. So, and I think this um, comment needs very nicely then to the discussion we will have the next uh, 45 uh, minutes. Uh, the podium, the panelists, uh, this is really a very distinguished group of uh, uh, people. Um, I'm really honored that I have been asked to chair this um, panel. My name is uh, Ingrid Hengster and I'm responsible for the Business Royal Bank of Scotland in Germany. I would like to ask the panelists now to come to the stage and join me here. I think. So. so, they are all here now. And I will introduce them uh, according to the seating order, starting to my left with uh, Stefan Gerlach, Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Ireland, uh, Professor Dr. Klaas Knot, President of the Netherlands Central Bank, and uh, David Volkerts Landau, Chief Economist and member of the Group Executive Board of Deutsche Bank. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Klinzi has already raised the question, member of the European Parliament. Uh, a bit of housekeeping in the beginning. We have 45 to 50 <coughs> minutes. Um, that's not a lot, and I'm sure each of the panelists can talk for a long time uh, about <coughs> the subject uh, to make sure that everybody can contribute and that we cover uh, many aspects of our discussion. I would like to ask them, please be short and uh, to the point and focused, and by doing so we will be really able, able to cover different aspects which we want to do. Um, if it's taking too long, I will give you a signal. This is not meant as an unfriendly signal, but just to make sure that we stay within time. I want to start this panel with um, um, a comment I received from a German politician a, a while ago, some days ago. And he said to me, he compared Europe uh, with, and the way uh, of Europe to the Union with an old car, old but good. He said, um, this car is moving on a bumpy and uh, dirty and dusty road. Uh, sometimes uh, there are wild drivers in it, but they're always brave. And uh, observers may come to the conclusion they will not get to their destination, they will not make it. However, in the end, the car makes it. And I like this picture a lot because it's a great symbol for the journey we are on, on our route to uh, Union. And uh, it shows at the same time there's still a lot to do and it's worth doing it. And um, with this picture would lead to the questions we would like to discuss today. We have uh, jointly selected two topics. One is very obvious, the banking union, and the other one is uh, the two-speed Europe. Let us start with the banking union. When we speak about the banking union, uh, we have to deal with the questions, what is the relevance of this union? What is still needed to make it work? And when you then move on to the second topic, the uh, topic of this two-speed Europe, we want to deal with the divergence between the southern and northern European country. <coughs> of course, there will be questions later on. You will have time to ask questions. And we will finish uh, in the last five to ten minutes with the final statements of the panel answering the question, which I think is extremely interesting, what is going to happen next? So let me move on to the first topic, the banking union. And we have heard it from Dr. Weidmann, we have heard it uh, from Madame Lagarde. The banking union is extremely high on the agenda of politicians and uh, policy makers and central bankers. And I would like to start with a bit of a provocative question. And uh, as the tradition is, uh, all the panelists will answer yes and no, and then the panelists will uh, go into <laughs> more detailed answers and comments. So my first question is, is there a danger of the banking union being used for unlimited access to the ESM? Is this the main reason why this is done? Um, I would like to start with you, Dr. No. Knott. No. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Klintz? No. And David? No. Okay. <laughs> so not a lot of controversion, but still. <laughs> I didn't but I, honestly, <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect anything different. But still, I would like to ask you, Professor Knott, please 
go elaborate a bit on why you think this is not the case? Yeah, I, uh, as you, well, as I indicated, I don't think it is the case, but obviously it's also dangerous in sort of denying that there is a certain risk here. Yeah. And this is also a risk which preoccupies uh, taxpayers in a lot, lot of uh, countries, <laughs> including mine, by the way, like yours. So I think we should be explicit about the risk and what we do uh, to manage it. In my view, banking <coughs> union is a concept going forward. It's about sharing risks and concomitant uh, supervisory control on a European scale. But I think with every joint risk scheme, whether it's an uh, insurance policy or what have you, um, the risk sharing can only be fair if there is by and large, uh, you can talk about sort of initial starting conditions. Now, there are sort of doubts whether uh, there are truly initial starting conditions in Europe. We have to sort of relieve these doubts by taking out an asset quality review. And I couldn't agree more with uh, actually what Madame Lagarde said here, that I don't think we will manage to set up a credible banking union which will be fully supported by uh, uh, also the citizens in the euro area if we don't start the banking union with having a very thorough asset quality review at the start. That asset quality review should then deal with the legacy assets they should simply be written off to their fair value. Now, there is a question who should bear uh, the burden of those write-offs. Write -offs. I think if a member country decides to bear that burden itself, then there should be no reason why, uh, why not. And this is actually a choice we made in the Netherlands when only a few weeks ago we, uh, we resolved uh, another uh, institution. If, however, there is an issue with the sovereignty of the sovereign in question in a different country, and sort of the resolution of the bank would only lead to additional issues with respect to the sovereign credibility, then I think the ESM recap should be open to sort of directly uh, recap the bank. Do, of course, a subject, of course, to sort of the conditionality that is associated that is in the rules of the uh, ESM. But I think it's not very helpful that we sort of uh, mingle the legacy problems that we have here and there in our banking sector with the aim of having a, a banking union going forward. And as long as we don't credibly solve the legacy issues, I'm afraid that this will lead to delays and sort of politicians not wholeheartedly wanted to, to go the full way into banking union. So I think this should be tackled head on. Okay. Um, David, from your perspective, the legacy assets, are this the critical aspect? Uh, first, an elaboration on my uh, no answer. When I said no, it was uh, in the context of the unlimited access to the ESM. Okay. Uh, I believe there definitely were thoughts in people's mind that this is a mechanism that could be used for uh, generous access to the ESM. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> otherwise, uh, 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 this, in my mind, lo looking at what happened over the last 18 months, is probably the single most important reform effort that has sprung out of the crisis, <clears throat> even though it has a long way to go, but it simply is a, a necessary condition for moving forward. It's not sufficient for undoing the crisis, but it's necessary. Otherwise, just for brevity, I would say that uh, the rest of my remarks are a linear combination of Klaus Knoll and Jens Weidmann, and I totally agree with both of them. <laughs> so I won't repeat all of that. Okay. You want to say something about the legacy aspects of oh, the obviously, assets? Obviously, yeah. legacy have to be kept apart. Uh, otherwise, you will get a socialization of the losses. So it's hugely important to uh, keep legacy apart, start afresh, or do a valuation of legacy. But to mix that up is a socialization of uh, losses on an unimaginable scale. Um, Dr. Klintz, how do you look at uh, these <coughs> aspects from a political perspective? And well, well, back to your answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I would agree with my neighbor here, no, because I don't think that uh, it, it opens the door to uh, unlimited um, access. Now, it is important, as uh, Mr. Weidmann has said, that the various member states uh, put, try to put their house, particularly with regard to the legacy uh, problems, in order as quickly as possible. And that is difficult enough. I, I just think of one particular Landesbank in Germany where it has taken, you know, years until we finally, under the pressure of, of Competition Commissioner Almunia, were willing to really uh, <coughs> do what, what was needed. Now, I think we, we have to look at it also in the context of what is being prepared right now, namely the crisis management uh, uh, proposals uh, that are being discussed in, in, in Brussels uh, this, very, this very moment. Um, 
uh, and if we do have in place uh, the, uh, the bail-in ability of, of various uh, uh, tools or elements, then of course this, this will help to, um, to also put put some of the banks in order. So I think legacy, uh, le the legacy asset problem has to be taken care of before we move forward. I do hope, and that's why I based uh, my, th that is what, why I based my no on it. Uh, I do hope that people will in future honor their commitments and live by the rules. As long as we live by the rules, I think we can be hopeful that it will work out if we do respect the rules as we've done in the past, namely, <laughs> partially only, then of course we do, we do have a risk. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, your view on this question? Well, I actually, unfortunately, I completely agree with the previous speakers. I mean, I think the current situation has sort of shown us that a, a banking union is essential for a properly functioning monetary union. And the banking union is not really intended to deal with current problem, uh, problems uh, as much as to make sure that future problems that are, that are detected in five years or ten years or twenty years is being dealt with in a more effective, in a more effective manner. A manner. I mean, it's, this is a little bit like falling ill and realizing that you need health insurance for yourself and for your family. Uh, clearly, there is a. Uh, and issue what to do with you know, the, the doctor's bill now. But uh, I mean, we should not focus on that aspect of the problem. We should focus on the long run benefits of having a well functioning banking union within the monetary union. This is going to be essential. Okay, good. Yeah, this uh, leads me to the second question, which I will ask uh, my colleagues here to answer with a yes or no um, answer. So the question is Is the ECB the correct institution to serve as European banking supervisor? I start with you, Stefan. Um, well, this is uh, very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I, will say, <laughs> I will say, um, I will say yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you have to take a choice, yes or no? Well, I will say yes then. Okay. <coughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yes, but. Yes, yeah, but. That's okay. the same. Okay. Yes for the moment. I say no. <laughs> you say no. I say no. Okay. So. Maybe, Dr. Klintz, you would like to start with your well, name and explain it? I mean, I, I have to be consistent because the European Parliament and, and the Econ Committee, which I'm a member of, we proposed already a couple of years, a bit more than two years ago, to set up a financial market, uh, European financial market supervisory system. And we said at the time, in fact, for banking and, and insurance companies, and at the time we said that system uh, uh, has to be close to, but not under the roof of the ECB. And therefore, I even convinced Sylvie Goulard, my French colleague, to put into her report to be located in Frankfurt. Uh, so that uh, the organization could be close to the ECB, but not within the ECB. I still see, despite all the precautionary measures, I do see two risks that we have right now. One is, of course, a conflict of interest between the monetary side and the supervisory side and its possible or potential uh, impact on, uh, on fis the fiscal side. That's number one. And the number two is I do see the risk that we, that we have a, that we divide the European <coughs> Union where it is not necessary. <coughs> we try everything we can in the, from the European Parliament to uh, sort of make sure that the, the SSM, as it is being called now, will be so attractive that non-Eurozone member states feel invited, very hardly invited to join. But fact is that they will never ever become part of the, uh, of the decision making in the last instance, the governing council, that they cannot be part of. And so there will be two kinds of, of memberships, and that is too bad, and, and I'm afraid that this is not good enough, despite all the other things that we try to, to put into it, not good enough to make sure that basically everybody is getting on board. So where would you locate it? Well, I would, I would have located it as a separate uh, uh, organization in, in Frankfurt. David, your view? Uh, well, the, S the SSM alone uh, uh, is not good enough, obviously. You need to have re resolution authority to give it teeth. Plus, you need to have a resolution fund uh, to resolve the institutions. Yes. That, and that's kind of where the difficulty is, because to close institutions is a hard thing to do, particularly within Europe, where uh, much of banking is highly politicized, uh, with directed lending and intervention at the board level everywhere. So it, it gets you into a political situation that would require a lot of... Uh, political interaction, and that makes me feel uneasy when I look at the central bank. <clears throat> Likewise, with the resolution fund, 
the administration of that. It's a fiscal issue. Uh, if you close a large group or you close a whole segment of uh, savings institutions, could have tremendous uh, drawing on the resolution fund. It becomes a fiscal issue. Uh, and again, within, perhaps in the US it might work, but within Europe, being as politicized as it is, uh, that is not without danger. Having said that, though, to set up all of this separately uh, will take too long. It's just it's a very long road. So that's why I say the ECB, but with proper safeguards. And <clears throat> I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure that there will be legal safeguards that can be. But, but it's a hard thing. It's not easy. And we, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't think it's just you know, by reeling off all these sentences, all these nice long words, all of a sudden we have something. It's hard. I think these are fair observations. Um, um, Klaus, how do you look at this point? I agree, uh, I think in principle with what uh, David just said, um, and that's why my answer will be yes for the moment, um, because I do think we need the banking unit, I do think it's an important uh, building block of the, <coughs> sort of the, the, the overall solution of the, of the Eurozone crisis that we uh, ha have been uh, facing and probably currently are still uh, underneath uh, the surface. Um, and at the same time, setting up a totally new institution is very problematic. I think to be effective, a supervisor needs credibility from day one that it supervises. There are only few institutions that we have in Europe that actually have credibility. I think the ECB is one of them. I think the, the ECB's credibility is undisputed. So I think also for pragmatic reasons, it makes sense to at least start the single supervisory mechanism within the ECB. But quite frankly, if sort of we uh, have arrived in Europe in, 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 in quieter waters, let's say 10 years down the road or so, I would clearly be open to sort of re-evaluating uh, uh, this decision. Please. Because there continues to be a fundamental tension between monetary policy responsibilities and supervisory responsibilities. <coughs> but unfortunately, at this moment, I don't think in Europe we can afford to be sort of principally right. We have to be pragmatically right to first solve the crisis and then later on we can sort of think back uh, from, uh, from first principles. So 10 years is quite a horizon. Stefan, for you it was relatively difficult to say yes or no. How, how do you explain your views? That, okay. um, well, I don't really know what correct here means. I mean, the ECB has been uh, designated as the institution responsible for banking supervision in the euro area, so, so there you go. Uh, I mean, of course, this is a time-honored question here. If you should separate supervision and, uh, and monetary policy, you can you know, argue this in, in both directions. The Central Bank of Ireland is, of course, both a central bank and also a, uh, a supervisor. But, of course, we don't conduct monetary policy, and that is precisely the, uh, the question. I mean, these are full-time jobs, if you mm. like. And it, uh, it seems to me desirable to separate these functions uh, in, in some way, in particular to make sure that monetary policy remains focused squarely on its objective, which is to achieve and maintain price stability. Uh, but of course, there are, uh, are, are practical questions and, and difficulties that you needed to establish this, uh, this institution very quickly. So perhaps this was the best way or the best thing that could be achieved uh, uh, now. But of course, uh, there is a future as well. And perhaps this is an issue that could be usefully re uh, revisited at a later stage. Thank you. I just would like to, to add a small comment. I think uh, the, the possibility that 10 years down the road this may be changed again, I think that's illusionary. Uh, that's completely out of the question because let's not forget, this is, of course, adding a lot of influence and power to the ECB. And no president of the ECB or board will ever, you know, lightly give that up again. Already Wim Dorsenberg at the time said, I want the ECB at one point in time to be the supervisor in Europe. Uh, that is many years ago. So I, I, I can't see that happening. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, Otherwise, I would say that however powerful uh, the ECB president is, ob obviously these questions are not solely determined by him. Uh, oh, we do have, I mean, supervision <laughs> is something that is executed within a political mandate, uh, whether you like it or not. Okay. I would move to my third question relating, relating the banking union. Um, also a very clear and precise question. Will the banking union finally solve the financial and debt crisis in the Eurozone? I start with you, David. No. No? Then Stefan? No. <laughs> Dr. Klins? No. 
No. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah, this was easy. Got more time. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of unity. Uh, perhaps, David, you can start and uh, share your observations with us. Why you come to this clear and quick no? Well, the banking union is a long-term uh, structural issue. Uh, it has little to do with what I regard as uh, the major elements within, that have to be addressed within Europe, which is first competitiveness and then the debt situation. And I regard the, the debt overhang as being the lesser of lesser importance than a competitive situation. So the, uh, <clears throat> and that has, that has only marginally to do with, uh, uh, with uh, the banking union. If we don't succeed in uh, addressing uh, through structural reforms, competitiveness in key southern countries, uh, then we'll have a real problem that banking union isn't going to solve. So that's why I said no. Okay. Well, we've heard before that the banking union really consists of three pillars. Uh, the single supervisor being one, and then the resolution and recovery fund being, uh, or regime being the second, and the deposit guarantee scheme. <clears throat> and number, the first one is in the making, and still it will take a bit more than a year or so until it really can, can start. But uh, I see, uh, you know, I see a, a, a need to wait for, for many, many years to come until we have a cross-border functioning European banking recovery and resolution regime. And, and the same is true for the deposit guarantee scheme. That will remain national for many years to come, at least when I sort of listen to, to my colleagues from other countries in, in the European Parliament and also when I listen to the various members of, 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 the, of the Council. And therefore, we cannot wait to solve the crisis until the banking union is complete. <laughs> then we would never solve it. So therefore, um, the answer is no. Okay. Yeah. Well, my answer was no as well, and I agreed with David. If you were to ask me what sort of my top three of, uh, of issues for solving, yeah, of, uh, solving the Eurozone crisis was, on number one, I would agree it's competitiveness. And it's sort of the, uh, the lack of willingness uh, on the side of the non-monetary mo policy makers in many of our jurisdictions to accept the restrictions that sort of being in a single currency poses on their policy domain, such as, for instance, wage formation, but also structural reforms to enhance pro uh, productivity. Well, that is not solved by a banking union. Number two would be uh, the link yeah, the deadly embrace between the banking sector and, uh, and sovereign risk. Yes, that will potentially uh, be solved by, uh, by the banking union, but it'll take a long time. Uh, it'll take some time because we will have to also face questions like what do you do with sovereign risk uh, on the bank balance sheet? Should we continue to zero, apply zero risk weights to it? I don't think so. But at least uh, it cannot easily and quickly be changed. I think it should be changed, but nonetheless, um, and, uh, and, well, and then number three actually would be sort of the fiscal problems we have in the Eurozone, but which in my view are not an issue in and of themselves, but are mostly actually the consequence of number one and two. Yeah. And that's why it has been so problematic to live up to the fiscal rules that we try to impose uh, upon ourselves. So banking union solves number two, uh, but not necessarily number one, uh, and uh, well, only indirectly and partly number three. Um, so I think banking in Europe will not solve <coughs> this problem, uh, but it will be a very helpful instrument in dealing with future uh, problems. If, if, if you go back and look at economic history, uh, there were very large stocks of public debt after World War II and after World War I. After World War II, the, uh, the problems were solved by rapid growth. Uh, they just sort of melted away the debts, if you like. The debts after World War I were not solved by rapid growth, and it was a, a problem in the 1920s and 1930s. A number of countries uh, uh, struggled with, with capital levies and so on and so forth. So growth is the solution here, and everything that achieves greater, more rapid growth uh, uh, is welcome. Um, so we need to enhance competitiveness in countries. We need to bring down wage uh, costs in countries such as Ireland, which I'm representing here today. Uh, we need to have structural reforms, and of course we need to uh, ensure that a number of other economic policies are sort of, uh, sort of turned in the right direction. I mean, the problem here is that there is almost an invariably a tension between the short run and the long run. Most economic reforms will have adverse short run consequences and, 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 very, and positive long run benefits, but it's very difficult, very difficult to sell reforms in a situation where uh, the short-run effects are, 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 
are negative. We had a uh, we, we will have a, re a compulsory reduction in in, in in public salaries in Ireland. It was just announced a couple of weeks ago. Of course, uh, that's not so great for people that are struggling. They work in the public sector and they are struggling with the mortgages. But of course, in the long run, this will be desirable. It will be helpful, enhance competitiveness. One additional uh, question regarding the banking union. Do you think, uh, Stefan, again, start with you, that the banking union will at least address the question of banks, the banking sector being too large or banks being too big to we, fail over time? We need to deal with these questions, it's clear. But this, I mean, I, I should avoid sort of quick fixes for long term questions or long term problems. It's important that these things are done carefully and in a thought out manner, because otherwise you end up with some solutions that looked good at the time <coughs> but uh, no longer work. So I think we should do this in a, in a slow and a very deliberate way. David, from your end, looking at big banks, how is your view on being too big to fail and how the banking union could address this um, issue? Uh, the too big to fail issue is a complicated yeah. one, obviously. Um, it's not so much the size of the institution as it is the interconnectedness of the system. <clears throat> so going through uh, 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 trading platforms uh, <clears throat> with common settlement, and uh, guarantees of settlement, things like that is uh, what will go a long way to uh, deal with too big to fail. Um, whether a banking union will address that depends on how the rules are written, uh, but certainly has the advantage of applying it in a level playing field to all the institutions. Uh, I think that's hugely important. Uh, the, the, the singling out of, of individual institutions are, uh, <clears throat> within Europe, or, uh, as far as regulations is concerned, all, all these small sets of institutions is incredibly uh, harmful to the competitive landscape and, uh, uh, and, and undoing the level playing field. So it, it's, that's one of the more harmful aspects of having a decentralized regulatory system. And, and presumably a, a banking union would go a long way towards addressing that. Thank you. I think it's not a time to move to our second uh, major topic or subject. Um, we are all aware of the fact that we live in a world of uh, two Europes. Uh, the outcome of the elections in Italy have uh, demonstrated this also very clearly. And we can see fundamental differences uh, between uh, the northern and southern European countries what, when it comes to necessary steps um, needed to overcome the crisis. And this is why I would like to focus on the second part of our discussion on this question, the two-speed Europe. And my first question, again, to be answered with a yes or no, is uh, has the financial crisis harmed European integration? I will start with uh, you, Klaus. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Stefan? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Klintz. Yes. And you, David? Uh, no. Emphatically, no. <laughs> uh. Good. I'm delighted that you <laughs> said no. Otherwise, you would have unanimous. Name it again. So maybe, David, you start with your comments first. Why no? Oh, if I see what has happened in terms of reform efforts and the coming together uh, of various aspects of Europe over the last 18 months, it would never have happened without a crisis. Mm -hmm. The only way you get things done in Europe is to have a crisis. So from that point of view, uh, uh, talking about a banking union today would just not have been possible if you hadn't had a crisis, just as an example. Mm -hmm. So I, I, see the, I see the crisis as being perhaps one of the most the driving element for uh, uh, having gotten us closer together over the last year, the last 18 months. I think this is a very fair observation, Dr. Klintz. Why did well, you Well, I, I, I look at it as, as a politician, and I do say, see that um, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the ambition that we had to really unify uh, Europe uh, more than before, also using the common currency, so far has <coughs> politically not really worked. I mean, there are, there are differences now that uh, we thought had, had, were, were part of, of the history, were no longer, did no longer exist. Animosities uh, come to the surface again. Uh, all of a sudden, there are, there are comments uh, uh, concerning political leaders, ministers, etc., that you didn't consider to be possible five or ten years ago. That is a fact now. Uh, I'm notwithstanding, of course, that we have tried to uh, introduce a number of reforms simultaneously across Europe and even across other outside European, also other jurisdictions. But, but I must say, uh, the the uh, the sort of strong argument that we had. 
that, if, if for instance, a, a common currency, and crisis would be the same, would unite this continent. This so far has not worked out, and I, I hope that it will change. Was this a surprise to you? Yes, yes. The, the animosities did come as a surprise, I must say. I, I've been, when I was chairing a, a special committee on the crisis, I was, uh, I was traveling to Greece and, and Spain and Portugal, all these countries, and it, I must say it, did, it was understandable, the reaction. When you see the difficulties that the ordinary pe people or persons are living under, you understand the reaction, but it did come as a surprise. And it, it, come, it, it particularly came as a surprise to me the tone that German media used with regard to, to, southern, uh, to the southern members of, of the European Union. You know? Plei de Griechen and, 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 the, and, and the like, that did, really did come to, to, to me as a surprise. I thought we had, come, we had been or, or gone beyond that point already. Thank you. Klaus? Yeah, I, I said wholeheartedly yes, because while I acknowledge eh, that some of the progress would not have been made without the crisis, that goes beyond saying. But aside from the political damage that the financial crisis has done to the uh, economic integration in Europe, I think there's also real economic damage. If you look, for instance, in the borrowing cost <coughs> for a good company in a bad country versus the borrowing cost of a bad company in a good country, mm. then, well, I mean, you would expect the good company to have lower borrowing costs than the bad company, but this is unfortunately not true. Uh, <laughs> if you're a good company in a bad country, your borrowing costs are much higher than if you're a bad company in a good country. And that, I think, is real damage yeah. that has been created by financial fragmentation in the Eurozone. It has been unintended. Um, I mean, I don't mind sort of sovereign borrowing costs going up, going up if sort of there are unsustainable policies. That's what we call market discipline, and I would have loved to see a bit more of 10 years ago. But I do mind the fact that all the companies which are located in the same country are also faced with higher borrowing costs. Mm. And that's due to financial fragmentation, and I think that has been sort of amplified by the crisis. Thank you. Stefan? Well, that's exactly my, my view, too. I mean, this financial uh, fragmentation is, is a very major problem, a uh, very, very uh, major problem uh, to deal with. Um, of course, I mean, every cloud has a silver lining, and uh, without the crisis, we wouldn't have had some of the political action that we've, we, we've seen recently, but I would have preferred not to have the political and uh, the, uh, the economic uh, uh, and the financial crisis, I must say. Okay. David has a comment. Yeah, yeah just a quick follow-up. <clears throat> no, there's no doubt that uh, um, the, the crisis itself has caused a renationalization of financial mm. markets, and we see this all the time, absolutely. Uh, and I didn't mean to deny that. Uh, but what I was thinking in terms of the structural reforms that have taken place and that are now moving along, with, there's a lot of speed, a lot of momentum behind this, and, and they keep on going, that wouldn't have happened. But for me, perhaps, the most important thing is the following. <clears throat> uh, I spent a fair amount of time in the U.S. talking to our U.S. clients and, uh, who have been uh, habitually negative about Europe and about the Eurozone and <laughs> won't last long. Uh, and I tell you this, that the, the, the fact that the Eurozone... Um, several times got together to bail out members that otherwise would have either left or would have fallen apart. To me, it's the single most important historical thing I've seen over the last five years. Uh, I would not have thought so. I would never have thought that, that uh, including Germany, uh, having put up tremendous amount of resources, uh, direct and indirect, uh, to keep the system together. Um, maybe all of you would have known this, but I would not have thought that Europe would have it in itself to be able to come together both politically and economically, and say, no, this is here to stay. Today, if you take a survey of this, most people will say, yes, the Eurozone is still going to wow. be here five years from now, unless you do it in New York. But, so. I, 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 I wasn't that surprised, because I think it's, it's become clear uh, already some time ago that the Euro, for instance, is, is not just a, an economic or monetary project. It's a, it, it is and has been from the very beginning a political project. project. Absolutely. And and when that really was 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 clear and, and to 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 the leading politicians, they had to react the way they did react. Yeah. With this, uh, I would like to move to our second question, which is linked to the first one. As we are here in Frankfurt, I would like <coughs> to ask, ask directly a question linked to Germany and its role um, in this um, two-speed Europe. Uh, question: Can Germany do more to overcome? the Europe of two speeds. And David, I would like to start with you here. Yes or no? Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, yes, but it shouldn't. 
Okay, so yes, <laughs> Dr. Klintz. I would say no, no, because it does already whatever is, is possible. Which is linked to the first answer, Klaus, you? Very little. Very, no, yeah, very little. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, and uh, Stefan? Well, uh, yes, of course you can always do more. Well, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a that's a very diplomatic that's, answer. Uh, so, David, can you elaborate on why you came to yes, but they shouldn't? Well, I believe that, uh, of course, Germany could uh, uh, stimulate domestic demand and uh, allow wages to increase faster and thereby achieve a uh, more level uh, competitiveness across the Eurozone. But I think that would be disastrous uh, for the Eurozone vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Yeah. So likewise, in terms of financial support, I think the Germans have been very steadfast in their financial support, have uh, taken enormous uh, indirect exposure via yes. Target 2 and all that. I have to go yes. into that. So I think... Uh, uh, I would take it one step further, it's a subtle point, but if Germany did any more, I believe the system would become politically unbalanced and there would be resentment building up that in, in the long run you might not be able to contain. So I think we're now just about at the point where uh, enough is enough and now the reform efforts have to come from the southern uh, countries. And let me give you a specific point. I believe it has been a tremendous propaganda victory of uh, governments to make us believe that Austerity is uh, <clears throat> at its limits. Um, <coughs> if you look at Spain, for instance, you have 22% youth unemployment. Uh, that's not due because of austerity. That's because due the labor markets is closed. Uh, you could probably do away with that uh, within, a single, within a single law, opening up, a, a, a changing the trade union law mm -hmm. and opening up the country yep. to labor market. Now, uh, it involves tremendous income distribution elements from the older generation to the younger generation, but that is what is holding back Spain. It's not a matter of uh, having to cut uh, fiscal expenditure. So from that point of view, I believe that, uh, yes, Germany has done enough, and now it's pre to pressure countries to do structural reforms and, and not to be bamboozled every morning by this austerity debate in the press. Thank you. Dr. Klint? Well, I would say it's been a tremendous communication success that the German government has uh, sold uh, the citizens of Germany the idea that, uh, you know, we, we help the others and, and, and bail them out without any cost to, <coughs> now or later to the German taxpayer. That's been, that's been quite, uh, quite courageous and it's been successful so far. Uh, and... and, <laughs> and and, and uh, <coughs> other measures like uh, boosting wages, or that is not uh, in the competence of the government. And we have the social partners that, that, that negotiate the wages and, and salaries, and, and that's it. So uh, I, I w do agree with, with the last comment that we should, of course, all, not just Germany, try to do more to really complete the single market. We, we pretend that the single European market has been completed in 1992. In fact, the law announced, you know, le marché est complet. But, but in fact, we know that it isn't. And particularly when it comes to the service sector, it isn't. And if we completed the single market, including the service sector, we could really stimulate growth. Um, and that would not cost extra. Thank you. Stefan. Um, I think the best thing the, that Germany can do is plainly to ensure that the German economy functions well. The German economy is roughly a third of the euro area. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. growing rapidly. It's a sort of zone of stability in the middle of Europe. The faster uh, the German economy is growing, the better for the rest of us, I think, is, is roughly uh, correct. Now, what precisely that entails is, of course, entirely a matter for the German uh, government, German voters, uh, to decide. Oh, I would like to add that actually, I mean, this discussion is often cast in terms of uh, the current account surpluses of the north versus the mm. deficits of the south. But if you think what would happen if we stimulated domestic demands in countries like Germany and the Netherlands, for sure, the current account of surplus of Germany and the Netherlands would be reduced. But I don't think actually that the current account deficit of the southern <laughs> countries would be improved by a single euro. Because, first of all, if you look at the import patterns of the northern countries, there's very little imports actually coming from southern Europe. If you look at the export patterns from the southern European countries, there's very little export substitution taking place between north and south. The problem is not just a problem of relative price between north and south. It's also a problem of sort of the composition of exports uh, and the fact that these countries compete the southern countries compete with countries outside the Eurozone, like China and India, who have 
cost levels which are imp almost impossible to compete with. So I think the, the problems are much more structural in nature than can be solved by a very, in my view, simplistic call for more uh, domestic demand stimulus in uh, the northern European countries. Thank you. Last question before we <coughs> move to questions from the audience. Um, do you still see a meaningful risk um, of a Euro country departing from the Eurozone within, let's say, the next three to five years? I would like to start with you, Dr. Klintz. I wouldn't rule it out. So this is yes. Yes. David? No. 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 Okay. So, Dr. Klintz, <laughs> you take well, it. Well, I think that, oh, I would hope, as a matter of fact, and I'm maybe taking an, an extreme position now, that we would at one point in time really answer the question whether or not a country is of systemic importance, point number one, and two, whether the possibility to pay back its debts is really given that we answer those questions correctly. And if the answer is no in two cases, then normally we shouldn't give any up. That, those are the rules also of the ESM. If, the, if there is a, no systemic risk, <coughs> and if there is, 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 is a clear evidence that the, 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 pay, the, the, the repayment of debt is basically impossible, then we shouldn't help. And I would hope that at one point we make the, we make the point. At one point in time, we make the point. Stefan? I think there's far too much political cohesion in Europe for this, for this to happen. I mean, 60 years of European integration will just be thrown away, uh, you know, mm. with, with a stroke of a pen, uh, if you like. So I just, I, just, I just can't see this happening. And in the sort of bigger issue of the, of the construction of Europe, Montreal Union is a very big part, of course, but it's not everything. It would be very hard to negotiate other important issues, energy issues, or trade issues, or foreign policy, defense policy, and so on and so forth, if you had a catastrophic <coughs> collapse in the, uh, on the Montre side. So I just, I just can't, uh, I can't see this, uh, this happening. Thank you. Klaus? Well, I agree to most of what's being said. I think the political co cohesion is simply too strong. The only thing I could add, I mean, you, you cast this question in light of recent discussions in, in Italy. I don't think that the uh, elections in Italy are actually sort of showing an anti-European sentiment at all. I think they're showing a sentiment which has domestic reasons and domestic expressions, and that's why I abstain from <laughs> further <laughs> commenting. But I don't think it should be interpreted in the light of uh, anti-Eurozone uh, feelings. Thank you. David? Oh, there also is the issue in that uh, setting a precedent. Uh, if a single country leaves the Eurozone, um, you have set a precedent. I mean, basically, you have gone from a common currency area to a fixed exchange rate regime. I can tell you this, is no, nobody will ever going to believe you again that a country will never leave again. And then you have exchange rate crisis. You go back to everything we had in the 80s and the 90s. So uh, for me, that's probably the single most important. When I think about cost benefit, don't let a country leave like Cyprus or Greece. So it's, it's just a hugely expensive from the system as a whole. Thank you. I think now it's a good moment to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so please say your name and your institution and then... Boyd Winton, I'm with the Bahrain Economic Development Board. Um, we heard mention before about, you know, whether the ECB should be the supervisory authority. <coughs> like, you know, it's running monetary policy supervisor, that's maybe too much for one entity. Maybe for the panellists on the right there, what do you think about the trend, and this could feed back into, into Europe, for the, the central banks to become masters of economic policy as well when they're targeting you know, unemployment rates, they're targeting growth rates and things like that that you're seeing in, in the US and Japan and, and other places. Do you think that's something that should be looked at, can promote European growth? <coughs> Maybe. <laughs> Klaus, you take it. Uh, well, I think um, <coughs> the crisis has underlined one more, that monetary policy is something that you cannot pursue in isolation. Uh, but let's face it, I mean, if we looked at our mandate in isolation, I would not need to be here because we are hugely successful. I mean, 2.1% inflation on average since 1999. I mean, but the problem obviously is that monetary policy is very much intertwined with other policy domains uh, within, uh, within the member states. And that's why we also, from the ECB side, have been confronted with sort of the monetary transmission process, cloughing up heterogeneity. Uh, reappearing in the, in the monetary union. And inevitably, if you want to 
sort of solve these issues, you also have to form an opinion on the non-monetary policy uh, domains. Now, as far as sort of our mandate is concerned, I think our mandate is okay. I don't see any reason to change it. And I think it is sometimes over rigidly sort of presented in the press. We have a clear primary mandate, which is price stability. And given when, at times when price stability is granted, there is also uh, room enough to take into account sort of uh, developments uh, in the real economy. But again, I uh, totally agree with the example that David gave on, on, uh, on Spanish unemployment. To the extent that the roots of such problems are structural in nature, what can we do? Okay, uh, I'm going to Frank from the University of Constance. I have a very basic question. You have mentioned that the resentment against uh, Brussels, against also the German dominance builds up and builds up. And uh, so we have the six pack, we have now the two pack. So the idea is to impose budget discipline, discipline. by always having more and more pressure from Brussels. I cannot see how it will really work. The French have already said you will never accept the visit of the Troika in Paris. <laughs> and Italy basically says the same. So therefore, we have, in the long run, I think we have a very strong need to change the rules of the game. Otherwise, uh, I see a very big <coughs> danger that uh, we can never get budget discipline. So my question is, what is the long run mechanism which you see in order to ensure budget discipline in Europe? A question to Dr. Glintz. Yeah. Well, let me, before I try to answer, and it's difficult enough, uh, uh, give you uh, a, 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 a or, or, yeah, tell you the story that I experienced when I met a, a French professor of economics uh, in France at one point in time. We were talking about the rules of stability <coughs> and growth pact and uh, the way that it, those rules have been uh, respected or not. And he said that the real difference between us French and you Germans is that for us, the rules of that pact were, are like the rules, the traffic rules. They are, po they are a point of reference. But when, when there is a red light and nobody is coming, I cross the road. And, and in Germ, for you, this is cut in stone. And you say, and, and the same is true for, for these rules. And unfortunately, already we see that neither Spain nor France will respect the rules that have been uh, reformed, you know. And so it, there is a strong po probability that uh, they are not the only two countries, but there will be others in the future. Now, uh, nonetheless, I think it has been, it has, uh, it has been successful to uh, sort of design those rules because the question that, the, the point that, uh, or the necessity rather, that the budgets have to be consolidated has in, in principle been accepted by everybody now. It's no longer being disputed. And in the old days, you know, there was a feeling, well, you know, we can finance the, 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 the debt, and if there's some inflationary pressure, so be it, uh, we get over that. This is over. I think now at least everybody has understood that without consolidating its financial situation will be difficult. Now, whether it will work, I don't know. Future will tell. I wouldn't rule out that it, it in many cases will not work. And there is no, I have no crystal ball to tell you what then the answer is. It, it will be, I, do, I shouldn't say that here, but it's, it's a closed room. I would not rule out that mid and long term, the ECB will come to the rescue more often than we, we as Germans would like. And I would also not rule out that sooner or later, or maybe mid and long term, we'll, we will have to have some sort of transfer mechanism. Dr. Lindt, uh, Stefan wants to make one short comment, exactly. and then um, we have two more questions. I think the answer to this question is that the countries will realize over time that, that those that have healthy public finances, uh, they will do much better and grow much more, more rapidly than the ones that don't. I mean, I'm Swedish by origin. Sweden had an enormous uh, crisis in the early 1990s. Unemployment surged, public debt surged, deficits surged, uh, and the consequence of this was broad political agreement across the political uh, spectrum that we should run a public uh, surplus every year of 1% of GDP. And 20 years later, Sweden did very well in this crisis because public finances were so sound. Okay. Two more questions. I think one over here and one here. So just start. Uh, Andrzej Ratzko, the National Bank of Poland. You defined the two-speed Europe mm -hmm. of integration from geographical point of view, the difference between north and west, north, <coughs> and, uh, north and south, sorry. 
but uh, we may uh, try to analyze this problem from different perspective as that uh, different difference of speed of integration between eurozone countries and non eurozone mm -hmm. countries from this perspective very interesting is the question of the banking union uh, Brits are very blunt in this respect they define that the banking union is should be created, implemented only in the Eurozone countries. What about, about the more, let's say, continental point of view? So the banking union should be attractive for non-Euro members which in future adopt Euro. What they are, uh, your opinion in this respect? This is a valuable solution yes. for non-Euro countries. Yes. Before we Thank answer you. that question, yeah. maybe can we combine it with the yes. last one so that we can answer them yeah, yeah. in one go? I, I think we can very well. Uh, Thomas Poppensieger from McKinsey. Um, uh, I was actually glad that you appointed us again to the uh, European Banking Union. I have a very particular question because in my experience in bank restructuring, two things are of essence that you agree upon in a restructuring process. One is that you understand the risks and the risk sharing of who has to bear the burden of the cost of restructuring, and second, that you can act with speed. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you talk a lot about you know, the uh, advantages of the uh, banking union. I fully subscribe to that. But how can you see a governance structure around the second very important pillar of the restructuring fund work in Europe with the current mechanisms and experiences we have work both speedily enough and agreeing quickly enough on risk sharing in bank resolutions? Maybe David, do you want to take the first one, no. then, then Dr. Klintz, you? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, all I can say is that we try here. We, we try everything we can to make sure that those that join the SSM voluntarily, because they are not or not yet members of the Eurozone, can do so on the same basis as the Eurozone members. Same rights, same obligations. As I said before, the only difference being they cannot have a seat in the, in, the, in the governing council. But all the others, they will be part of the supervisory committee, they will be part of the steering committee, they will have the same rights. And that should make it attractive. And the feedback we've gotten so far from the various member states that potentially uh, could join voluntarily uh, is in fact that there's a strong interest. The UK has made it clear, never ever. Okay, period. Uh, Sweden, I think, uh, is also hesitant, but the others, uh, I think, may well join. Okay. We'll take the second one. Oh, okay. Um, uh, okay, let me then first comment on the second one. Um, well, that I think underlines the fact that the uh, single supervisory mechanism needs to be complemented with a single European resolution mechanism. Yeah. Because if there is no single resolution mechanism, I would even go so far to say that it would undermine the effectiveness of the single supervisory mechanism that our political masters are looking for. I mean, they right, talk about an effective SSM. Well, part of the effectiveness <coughs> will come from the fact that there is a credible threat that an institution might be closed and resolved. And part of that credibility has to do with the speed within which that can happen. I think we need to go in Europe from bailout to bail-in. Mm -hmm. That means that actually it's more the mechanism and the legal powers which is of interest than the resolution fund. I think the publications that have been around suggesting that there should be a resolution fund of some few percentage points of Eurozone or EA, Euro area GDP, I think they have been <coughs> hugely misleading and I think they are actually feeding sort of the sentiment in countries that this is going to sort of mean <coughs> big money being spent and, uh, and big risks being shared. I think bail-in should be the new norm. And yes, of course, in any resolution that one is involved, at the end of the day, there needs to be some money to smoothen out sort of the, the final uh, elements. And for that, you need a fund. I think the fund needs to be uh, funded by the industry itself. But in the interim, you have a problem that there will not be no fund and there will be no funding. So you need a credible backstop. And for that, yes, I think you need the ESM uh, definitely in the, uh, in the early years. Can I, one Can more comment briefly, yeah. on the openness of the banking union. Uh, I totally agree. It should be open for all uh, non-Eurozone countries. And I want to remind those that sort of actually within the Euro, uh, within the European Union, we only have INS and pre-INS, except Denmark and the UK, who have a derogation. But all other countries are actually on their way to the Eurozone. 
And therefore, it's quite logical that they're also on their way to sort of the arrangements of, uh, of the banking union. Um, and the single supervisory board that will be established within the ECB structures, I think, will have quite, uh, an, uh, uh, quite some room for maneuver and will quite have quite some independence vis-a-vis -vis the governing council uh, that sort of countries do feel uh, and can feel represented within the single supervisory mechanism because they will be represented in the supervisory board, even if for some time, for some limited time, they will not still be represented in the governing council because the admission, the accession has not yet fully taken place. Thank you. I think with that we come to our last round, which is also a nice tradition. I give you half a sentence and you complete it. <laughs> and it has to do with the uh, question, what is going to happen next? And I start with you, Stefan. The sentence is, as a consequence of the euro area's current difficulties with reforms. It will, currently, it will ultimately grow stronger. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great message. <laughs> um, Klaus, the German taxpayer will not be all that dissimilar to the Dutch taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> and David, difficult question, in five year time, the euro will? Still serve 17 or more countries, and uh, have an increased share in global reserve holdings, <clears throat> and trade below the purchasing power parity of 115 to the dollar, perhaps as low as parity. Great, also very positive. Dr. Klintz, the monetary union without the banking union is? Uh, not stable, not, uh, not, as, not as stable and as strong as it uh, could be and should be. Okay. Yeah, I think with this last comments, I would like to come to the closing remark and coming back to the picture which I used at the beginning, the car, the old car on the bumpy road towards monetary and uh, fiscal union. Um, I think the positive outlooks, outlooks made very clear we are not yet there. But I think we have at least <coughs> given a lot of momentum to the car driving on the road. So I would like to thank the panelists for the discussion and you, the audience, for listening and uh, contributing. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.